Good morning, Gospel Life. I said, good morning, Gospel Life. How you all doing? We're just going to testify of the goodness of God this morning. Is that okay? Thank you for your love. Thank you for your joy. Thank you for your peace, God. And we're grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You can clap your hands like this.
forget that I'm actually up here. So, <laughs> how are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. My name is Renee, and I just want to welcome you here to Gospel Life, and glad to see everybody. Where is everybody today? I'm looking out here. Right, man, come on. Summer isn't here yet, is it? Almost, almost. Hey, so uh, if this is your first time here, I just want to welcome you, encourage you to take a step over to Take 5 after the service and just, you know, kind of we want to meet you and then kind of talk about if you have questions about the church, we want to be able to answer some questions there. Or if you're looking to get involved, that's a great place to figure out maybe you want to help out and serve somewhere. And speaking of serving this summer, so we have VBS. Ooh. I heard a rumor that surfer Steve is going to be there? Yeah, I think so. All right, all right. So surfer Steve is going to be there. And you're probably wondering when the time is. So it's going to be June 17th through the 20th. And I just want to encourage you, whether you have kids, whether you don't have kids, whatever. You know, maybe you want to serve in a way that you donate some cookies or, or you know that there's kids in the neighborhood and you encourage those kids in the neighborhood to come or you encourage your own kids to come. So just, you know, I just encourage you to figure out where you'd like to serve. They definitely need the help. Also, I have here in my lovely hands, what is this? A baby bottle, but it's not just any baby bottle. <laughs> we have a specific purpose for this. So uh, we've done this a couple of times here at Gospel Life, but someone told me this morning, this has been a tradition with Village Bible. They've been doing it forever, and it's just moved over to Gospel Life. So this is an opportunity where you can take a baby bottle, fill it up with your change, your pennies, your dollars, whatever the case is, and bring it back here the weekend of Father's Day. And this is going to be an opportunity for us to bless mothers who are pregnant and need some extra help. And so we've kind of connected with this place called Care Network, and this is kind of one of the things that we do. So my husband and I had a competition last year. I don't even remember who won, but we had them filled to the brim. So I just refilled them, and they were they were gone by the time uh, I got out of service this morning. So there's, so make sure to pick up one there, okay? And also, I just want to thank you for just all your tithes, your offerings, your giving, Man, it has been a blessing, and I've just seen this church grow. I know I'm looking around saying I've seen them grow, but <laughs> a little slim this morning, but I think everybody's out there joining, enjoying the weather. But I have just seen this church grow and just, just excited to see what the Lord has to do. So um, just thank you for all that you do. Know that maybe you might not be always seen, but we appreciate you. God sees you, and that's what's important, right, that you're doing what he's asking you to do. So if you could just take a minute and pray with me, and then we'll get, get moving on. 
Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for each and every person that's here, Father. Thank you for their tithes, their offerings, their giving of themselves, Father, just to see your church grow. And so, God, I just thank you for that. Pray that you would meet each and every person where they're at today, Father God. Speak to their heart. Pray over the service. Pray over Pastor Tay, God, that you would just move mightily. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, I don't care what it takes. Our students need to have fun. They need to be hanging out with friends. And it has to be transformative. No, no, no. You're not understanding this. This summer camp has to be the most impactful week ever. Students, we are so excited to announce summer camp 2024 happening this July. There will be an outdoor course with a zip line, water park, Chick-fil-A of course, and great messages. You do not want to miss out. Not only that we're going to have so much fun for you, this is going to be the camp that prioritizes gospel above all. Last year in summer camp in 2023, we have seen more than 40 students come in faith to get baptized at all these different churches in Chicagoland. We want to see more of that as we're going to invite Pastor Ryan and the Gospel Life Worship Band, lead worship for us, and a dynamic speaker to deliver a gospel-saturated message so that you may experience an incredible, life-transforming, spiritual breakthrough in your life this summer. Parents, we are bringing camp to you. Make sure to get your child signed up because they do not want to miss out. Scan the QR code or use the link below to get them signed up ASAP. If you are a local pastor or a youth pastor in Chicagoland area, I would love to invite you to join us in our Chicagoland summer camp here at Gospel Life. We want to partner with many more churches to reach more students here in Chicagoland. It's going to be a life transforming experience for you to learn how to find and follow Jesus in your walk with Christ in your daily life. Don't forget to also invite your friends. You don't want to miss it. Sign up at the link below and we hope to see you there this summer. Sounds good? Be, be there. there. All right, what did you guys think about my acting? I feel like it's getting better every year, you know, so next year is getting better. But guys, um, as you watch from the video, we are doing something very special and different this summer. Uh, we usually, I think I went to three camps, uh, no, I think I went to two camps before this year. I went to Streeter, Illinois, which is um, our south, um, and also we went to Wisconsin, uh, two hours north, and this year, we had just had a really big meeting, we had a lot of decisions to make, and one thing that we had to talk about is the impact of camp. Right? And even being here, it was like my calling moment of Lord calling me to student ministry. And last year, we, had a, we just had an amazing spiritual impact. We baptized 44 students after one camp. Uh, so we realized, okay, like this is that. That's right. That's right. We want to be more that. Um, so we're thinking, man, how can we actually like invite more people? How do we make this cost more affordable? How do we make this work? And so this year, we're doing something different. We're actually bringing camp experience here at Gospel Light. We're doing a local camp uh, this year. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to invite my friend Rachel. Can you come up here for me real quick? Can we give it up for Rachel? Yeah. Um, as you know, I'm kind of entering kind of the busiest season in my life. Uh, so since I'm getting married in June, I might not be able to reply to your emails and text messages, right? Uh, so because of that, I have a summer camp director here who's going to be helping me with all these details and logistics of camp. Can you tell us, Rachel, kind of like what activities we're looking to do and all some, some stuff like that? Well, even though we are here in DuPage County, we are not going to stay exclusively in DuPage County. We are going to bring some extra fun, unique experiences to these kids every single day. First day, we're going to wow them with food. I mean, what's the better way to get to teenagers' hearts than food? So, and then the next couple days, we'll go do, we're going to bring the camp experience of treetop adventures and zip lining. We're going to bring it to them. And those kids are going to have the opportunity to do that. We might have another fun activity that day. And then the following day, we're going to go to Raging Waves in Aurora, Yorkville, whatever. So these kids are still going to experience the same level of camp excitement just here. And the great thing about that, as Piper mentioned, and you'll probably talk even more, is because it's here, we don't want to hear the excuses that they can't come. It's here. 
So, uh, and hopefully they'll be able to bring some friends. It'll be a great outreach experience too. Rachel. On top of that, this year, to make it local and to make it more affordable, uh, I think usually camp costs like $275 to $300, which is, uh, which is a lot for some families who has like a lot of kids. Uh, this year, we're actually doing something very special. We're cutting the cost to $150 per kid, right? And this is through the generosity of our church, and we're just really excited for that. Not only that, we're not calling this just a gospel life camp. We're inviting a lot of churches in Chicagoland and calling it a Chicagoland summer camp. Uh, we currently have um, agreed with with uh, um, seven to eight churches to come join us in our camp experience this summer, which is very exciting to see more of that. Uh, but, one, but, when, but, but when I was thinking about this whole church partnerships and more churches joining us, I remember the incident that happened uh, at camp last year. Uh, we were in Wisconsin, and one of the churches that we reached out to was a small Russian immigrant church in Vernon Hills called Lighthouse Bible Church. And they brought like, I think, five to six kids. And one of the kids, he was a sixth grade student, and he didn't speak any English, right? So like, I tried to talk to him. It's just a lot of hand gestures. And he was a sixth grade student. His name was Stan. And I tried to like, you know, get relationship with him, like talk to this guy. But because of language barrier, I didn't know like what was going on in his life. And one of the leaders came to me, and, and she was telling me that Stan's parents have passed away during the war. His house was burned, and he just, is, just has just so much wounds in his life. Right? And I, I just couldn't believe it. I've heard a lot of stories in the past, but it just seemed like one of the you know, most tragic stories that I've heard. Uh, but what was really inspiring is like this guy who doesn't speak the language, th this guy who doesn't even understand the sermons because it's just so hard because he's from a different country, at the end of the night, and the third night after Pastor in Austin spoke in Wisconsin, he dedicated his life to Jesus. And we were able to watch that, right? And then, um, that's right, we want more of that. And that's our only one goal, you know, we, we're all about activities and fun stuff, but only one goal is for, uh, for people's lives to change. And I have a three requests for you, right, for you guys with the congregation. Uh, number one is to pray, right, pray for us, pray for the lead team, pray for the leaders, pray for the students, but most importantly so that we can be gospel-centered and so that more students' lives will be touched and it will be changed. And secondly, uh, we want more volunteers, right? And you get to work with us. You know, I promise you, we're pretty fun. We feed you, you know, you're going to be having fun. You might be tired, but it's okay. We're going to encourage you. All right, that's right. Um, so if you want to serve in any ways, please come talk to me. And please come talk to Rachel in any capacity with the food team, security, hospitality, small group leader. We have a lot of needs. Uh, so please feel free to um, reach out to us. And lastly, uh, if you are like thinking, man, Daniel, I can't um, serve that time from July. Uh, there's a way to give. Uh, one is to uh, maybe um, donating snacks. Um, Rachel's going to be making a uh, snack donation uh, link. So if you want to like help us uh, with the providing for snacks and for food. And, and also, we also have a scholarship fund for our summer camp. Uh, yeah, I know we cut the cost of $150, but even that, there are some families who can't afford that who still want to join us for camp. And it's your generosity uh, that allows us to just fuel our ministry to advance the gospel to our next generation. Uh, so as you move on with the service, I'm going to take some time to pray as we go on. Father God, we are just so grateful for the next generation, so grateful for this opportunity. Lord, not just summer camp, but also VBS that's happening uh, literally so soon, Father. And Lord, you, uh, I just believe from the bottom of my heart, we all do, that you have not given up on the next generation. Father, this is not just a part of annual summer ministry. This is a, the most pivotal moment in their spiritual life where the next generation confesses their life to you once again. Lord, I pray that every single student who comes to camp this year, that you, were, that you would send so many lost souls, that they would come here, they would find the light, they would find you, and live to advance the gospel. We love you. We use your name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we continue in worship. And I just want to remind you as we sing this song that the goodness of God has no choice but to prevail over you. Whatever's going on, the goodness of God is chasing you down. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. God. Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness 
this morning, Lord Jesus, for you rule and you reign, and we love you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Quincy and our worship team. So good. Come on, can we sing a little more about his faithfulness? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need, Thy hands have provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord. the truth of our lives. Thank you for lifting your voice in that refrain of our God who is so good. And this is the day where we focus all of our praise and our attention to a God who is absolutely worthy. Thank you, Quincy, our worship team, job well done, and Quincy's filling in today. And uh, gifted, gifted, gifted team we have here. And so good to see you kids. If you haven't left already, you are dismissed and excited to jump in uh, today in what could be a, uh, a tough passage to kind of walk through uh, together. And uh, it was an elderly gentleman who was sitting on a park bench one day. He was basking in the sun, and here comes another gentleman, and they kind of stare each other down, and they both uh, sit down, and they look across and didn't say a word, just stared each other in the eye. And, eye. and after a while, one of them took a deep sigh. And the other one jumped up before he said anything. He said, if you're going to talk politics, then I'm out of here. Friends, you can't do that today in church. <laughs> you can't jump out of your seat and exit the room. Because God's word does shape every part of our lives and speaks to every part of what we face, of what we have to endure here on earth. And this conversation, in some regard, for years have caused tension for years have called controversies and conversations that have sparked deep controversy and debate. Where in circles, maybe in your own lives or uh, your own uh, work or family, uh, this conversations or some conversations like this has caused deep hurt or it has festered some deep wounds by words and actions or prejudices or racial divides. It's a discussion that is sticky of people's own ideologies and their own dogmas where it's kind of too much to bear at time and discuss what we would rather jump up and say, I'm out of here. But friends, let me appeal to you today in our time together is do not disengage. At this point, the time we're going to spend examining God's word to teach us, and here's my hope, is that you don't wall up. That we don't begin to assume, that we don't begin to infer, or we don't cast judgment, or we don't read into areas that are not vocalized. 
But I think we receive these instructions and these commands of God of how we as Christians must respond to the authority, hear me, the authority of government. And here's what I promise to you, that I will not beat up parties, that I will not beat up positions, that I will not beat up uh, people, nor would I use this platform of my own to address my own party choice or my thoughts of how I like to run the states and the country, although I will look really good as a president. (laughs) Uh, What I hope today is to remain neutral and just for the sake of making sure we walk away with the application of the text, not from the application of Tavon, of my beliefs or my preferences. And so uh, let's jump right in. Lord, we confess that we somehow understand this passage by the Spirit, and we need your help to understand a little more. Lord, this is a hard pill to swallow, and so, Lord, I pray that through your Spirit, uh, you enlighten our eyes to see the things that is meant to be taught here in this text. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 13 is where we're going to be, verses 1 through 7. We've already preached a little uh, 8 through um, 14, and now we're going back a little bit because at this point, point, what Paul does is he makes it clear in this text that this is a little bit challenging to think through and to to talk through. But what he writes here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is we ought to submit. We ought to submit to our governing government and our governing authorities, even if we don't like them. Because what the government is designed to do, the governing authorities, they are ministers that are called to do two things, punish evil and promote good. That's it. They are ministers. Now, I don't mean, of course, gospel preaching ministers. Some uh, are ordained, but in the sense of ministers to rule and to uh, have authority under God's position here in the, the world. And when they do that, they do two things. They are to punish evil and to promote good. Let's examine this thought over the next couple minutes. We have Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, reads this. Let every person be subject. Let all people be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority, watch this, this is super key in our time together here. For there is no authority except from God. And to those who exist, ah, have been instituted, or other translations say, has been established by God or appointed by God. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For the rulers are not to terror, to good conduct, but to bad. But you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then uh, do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God or minister of God. An avenger of who carries out God's wrath to the wrongdoer. Verse 5, therefore, one must be in subjection, submission, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of their own conscience. Verse 6, for because of this, (laughs) we all hate this one, you should pay your taxes. (laughs) For the authorities are ministers of God attending to the very thing. Pay to all who is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. This is the word of the Lord. At this point, this is a lot to swallow and a lot to sift through of government and our governing authorities. When we submit to human authorities, at the end of the day, it is a reflection of how we are submitting to the ultimate and divine authority we find in God. Now, what Paul is saying and what I am saying, we are not saying that the human authorities are God. (laughs) They are not. There is only one true God. They are not God. However, their positions and their appointments 
still have to do with the sovereignty of God and his control in all of the earth, in all of the world, in all of the universe, and in all of the heavens. You see this reoccurring theme that Paul drops into us for the first seven verses of this chapter is this, that the society's controlling powers, as God's people, we ought to submit to them. And at this point, he forcefully and clearly makes it plain. And here's, here's the point I make here, that there is no government ever, ever, ever that is perfect. Whether you live here in the States or you live in another country, there is no perfect government. And what the scripture commands us to do and what we just read is to do not wait for the perfect government. Do not wait for the perfect person or party or people. And I'm just not just talking about in Washington, but even here at the municipal level, even here in your village or your city or your aldermans, do not wait for that right person to come around. And don't rebel so hard that you feel like when that time comes, now I can commit. We finally get that wrong. Because the word here is that we ought to submit to the authorities the governing authorities of our land. And so, friends, it's no matter what party, what party you rep, what person you rep, what side of the fence you're on, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, Libertarian, white, blue, purple, we have the command from the Lord that we ought to maintain useful submission to our government. And we're going to explain that what that looks like in just a moment. And at this moment, here's what we walk away with, is that we are called to be a good citizen, even if our government is bad. We're called to be a good citizen, even if our government is bad. Friends, remember who is writing this text and where he is writing this to. Paul is writing this scripture. He is writing this book to the Christians in Rome. Now, if you know anything about Rome, you know during this time when the Christians would have heard this from the apostle Paul, they probably would have been stirred to their heart. (laughs) They're thinking in their mind, do you understand what you are saying to us, Paul? Well, why? Because Rome at all was not keen or loving or kind to Christians. You remember who sits on the throne during this time by this guy named Nero. Nero is this, was the emperor, and all that Nero said to do, they did. And so Nero absolutely hated the Christians. And so what Nero would do is he would set Christians on fire and then put them out in the streets. And then he would go and set parts of the city on fire and let it burn. He would blame all of the destruction upon the Christians. He absolutely hated the Christians. And the thing Paul writes here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is, hey, believers in Rome, your job is to submit to the authorities? A little strange, but he guards it with why the submission is to the authorities because if you look back here at verse uh, number one at the end of it, he says this, for there is no authority except from God. And those, have exist, those who exist have been instituted by God. Christians were being persecuted under the Roman government in all kinds of ways. And friends, what this sermon is not, this sermon is not a message that says, well, if the first century Christians can do it, then so can we. No, it's a clear command from God that we all have a fellowship or command to submit to the authority under their harsh conditions. They submit it. And the question that I wrestle with this week is how? Think about our own lives. Think about our own nation where you got people holding offices and positions that should not be in those offices or positions. Rather, what side of the fence you're on? People that have no moral conduct. People that all they want to do is call wrath and and trouble how here's here's how here's how and the text makes it so clear he says because you're going to be able to endure and hang on once you recognize it goes very basic once you recognize the sovereignty of God once you recognize that God has established all authority 
in two realms, which we talk about in just a moment. He has established all authority here on earth and in the heavenly realm, and he has established or, or he has instituted these men and women to be in position in the world. Now, what that means is God is not responsible for the sins and the tyrants of these people. Not at all. Because of the brokenness of our sin, God is not responsible of that. They are acting in their human condition. But what he is saying is I have appointed and I am in charge of everything. He talks about, about this. All that exists is instituted by God. And the reason why the early Christians were able to hang on. And the reason why, dear brother and sister, you and I will be able to hang on when the going is going to get tough when the persecution is going to get deeper, is when you remember the sovereignty of God. You know something about the sovereignty of God, don't you? That means that he is God who has the power and all of the know-how. He's not thinking about it. He's not trying to figure it out. He's already got it mastered, that God has the power and control to rule his creation. And it is over that creation and the creature where God establishes this, this world order and where he is ruler, where he is king, and where he, where he is Lord, capital L-O-R-D. There is no other God before him, Yahweh, God, where he is Lord. His sovereignty reigns. And at this point where the sovereignty of God rules, his rule is exercised through God's authority as king, his control over all things, and his presence being with us forever. His control meaning that everything happens according to his plan and to his intentions. That need to be repeated. When we think about government and governing authorities, God has established that according to his plan and to his intentions. Authority means that all that he commands ought to be obeyed. Presence means that we encounter God's control and authority in all of our experience so that we can never escape from his just justice or his love. Arthur W. Pink says this in his book, The Sovereignty of God, an old classic. He says this, that you deny that God is governing matter, then you deny that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. And when we do that, I love this, and when we do that, all sense of security is gone. When we forget, when we forget that the goofies sometimes in positions are appointed by God because God has authority, when we only focus on that, when we laser in on that, he knows, you know what happens is we lose a sense of security. That this world is not our home. That this world is not our land. That these people are not our God. God is God, and he is God all by himself. When we deny that, we lose all sense of security. He goes on to say this. Two alternatives begin to confront us, and we have to choose. He says, number one, either God governs or he is governed. Either God rules or he is ruled. Either God has his way or men has his way. This is how we hold fast to what goes on in our country, to go, what goes on in our villages, to go, what goes on in our cities, is when we remember God is in control of it all. And since God is sovereign over all things, and these authorities exist and have been instituted by God. It's very clear in the text, but here's, here's my heart for you. Here's my pastoral heart from you. I hope you take away from this is that we must take comfort, real deep comfort, as we future focus on knowing that God is in charge and he is in control of all things. Point Blake simple that he is in control of all things. But this submission, this subjection to authority, Tay, what do you mean by that? Let me give you four clarifications of what makes this point very clear to our submission around the government or governing authorities. Number one, submission does not mean you always agree with the government. Amen. It does not mean that. That's, that's not the submission. It doesn't mean, you know, that, that S word we all hate. I submit. What do you mean? I have my own rights. Yes, you do. I don't want to be no one doormat. That's correct. We want to love this country, and we want to work hard for, uh, for, for what we have and the people that are here. And so that, that doesn't mean, submission doesn't mean you can't disagree with the government. 
Number two, submission doesn't mean you cannot work to change the government. Here's the picture of that. That doesn't mean you put your head down in the sand and just wait. Oh, I can't wait until the reds are out. Or, oh, I can't wait until the blues are out or they're in. Oh, I can't wait for this to change. Now, you know what it is? God sometimes has stirred in your own heart for you to be an agent of change, for you to join that board. For you to sit on that local board, for you to be a part of the change. Maybe God has stirred in you for you to run to local offices, run for that offices, and uphold the name of Jesus and the banner and the unity that he describes, that he gives to us. So in the government doesn't mean like I just got to wait until it changes all of a sudden. No, we actually got to be a part of that. Number three, submission does not mean you sin if the government asks asks you to do it. No. Believe that if you are put in that situation, you would do what God has commanded you to do very clearly, and you will not sin no matter what consequences come your way. Here's why, because we do not answer to man. We do not answer to one man. We answer to God. Our submission is not this blind kind of leading or faith and causes us to sin because the government or governing authority said so. That's not submission. Our submission and our allegiance, which we'll close at the end of this sermon, is to one person. It is to God. And then finally, number four, submission does not mean there can ever be a justifiable disagreement against your government. Because there's some things that just does not get us to a better place. There's, there's some policies and bills that hurt us all. And to have that moment with, with grace and with tact and with truth actually honors our Lord. And so submission is not just getting steamrolled by those people who are in position. And then we next see in this text the idea that all people, every person, have to submit to authority, governing um, authorities, government. It's because of the sovereignty of God we kind of keep this foundation that he's established it all and pointed it all. But watch, watch what happens next in verses 3 and 3 through 5. For the rulers are not to terror the, uh, to good conduct, but to bad. Would you not fear for the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he's God's servant for good. Again, what's the role of government? To punish evil and promote, promote good. But if you do wrong, <laughs> be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger of, who, of those who carry out God's wrath to the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of a good conscience. Here's what God has telling us, is God takes seriously the authorities that are appointed over us. God takes seriously the, uh, the, appoint, the authorities that are appointed over us. Over us in these two, three verses at this point, you know what this highlight is God's justice. It's God's justice. That God will punish what is wrong and promote what is good. And punishing will and should come for those who do wrong. And friends, that's why I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for our law enforcement. I'm very thankful for our military and our men and women who serve in armed forces because they are doing just that, punishing what is evil. Now, Tay, I realize that statement in 2024 as a black man in America is hard to hear. But here's what I can say with full confidence, that every officer, that every military leader is not out to get you for you. Their job, according to the law of God, according to the scripture, is to punish what is evil. Just this week, we, we held about 150 to 200 uh, law enforcement officers at our church. Uh, uh, two years ago, myself, Dennis Parrish, Michelle Fry, we sat in the class, um, Citizens Police Academy. Hey, and my other guy was there. That's right. We sat in that class. Um, and to hear what they have to fight against, to hear how every day they put on uh, that badge and that belt and and that bulletproof vest, hopefully make it back home to their families. But we fed them barbecue for the second year in a row, and they had a fantastic time, and they walked through a church door. Some were not having any relationship with Jesus Christ at all. Dennis Paris and his team led the charge with this fantastic 
And as you sit around this table and you hear these conversation of these men and these women and these local police, municipal officers and these state troopers and the list goes on and on, your heart begins to grow a deep appreciation for the hard work that every day their job is to go and punish evil and promote good. That's from helping the cat get across the street, but also those who are involved in dark, deep, harmful criminal activity. And then for our military and our armed forces, men and women, our veterans who sit in this room, both this service and our last service, who tack up to do the things of going into these dark spaces to make sure our freedoms are protected and to make sure that we have coverage over this land. God has established that too, and he takes seriously of those he has punished, uh, appointed over government. But I get it. I get it because justice in our nation is hard. Justice in our nation is tainted. What about, Tay, the man or the woman who gets wronged or punished wrongly or improperly because of their creed or color or race or where they live. I get it. But also on the other end, what about the other person who does go away for a long time because of a really strong, heinous crime they do? And sometimes the words out of our mouths, I know it has come out of mine, is what? I hope they rot away and don't see the light of day. That breaks God's heart. Because our hope should be, although they are getting the consequences and penalties that are due to them, I pray to God they find Jesus. Maybe through a prison minister, or maybe through a broadcast, or maybe through a chaplain at the jail, that they come to this understanding of how wrong they are, but how Jesus has made them right with God. Justice is hard for us on a human level. It's tainted. And when we Forget not to ground that in the identity and the work of what God is and who he is. We get it all wrong. And then we create silos and we begin to to bring our own thoughts and ideologies here. Uh, Paul is saying through the work of the Holy Spirit, you know what? The law has power to punish what's wrong. But if they do that wrongly, then they should be punished. But if they do that rightly, it makes things run smoothly this Order, he says. The sword is not given to them. Sword during that time. I love how Paul uses this, knowing his audience. Uh, how was punishment used back in the first century? Through a sword. And the sword was not come to just tickle your ear. The sword was come to decapitate your head. And if your head was getting ready to roll, they better make sure that they did everything right to make sure you were being punished rightly. Paul says, you have, they have the sword not to be used in vain or not to be used improperly. There is order, both citizens and powers. And so, Tay, what are you saying is, yeah, the government and the governing forces actually have a good purpose because the government is the necessary institute to do avenge for the wrong for the wrongdoer. I know as you sit and you hear this message, you're like, man, I was really hoping we was preaching something else today. (laughs) And as I sat through this all week, my prayer has been, one, We can't escape the word of God because this is what his word says. It's like we have this this submission to the authority. But what this also does for us is ground us deeper in knowing that God really absolutely has all things under and in his control. He is in charge of both the earthly realm and the spiritual realm. Matter of fact, I love this next part. Look at uh, verses 6 and 7. And this is where many of you may throw tomatoes at me, but it's true. It says this, for because of this, you pay taxes. And for some who pay your quarterly taxes, June is on the way. (laughs) And they're going to come out of your account. But I love this. It says, you pay your taxes, for the authorities are, again, ministers of God, attending to this very thing. And I'll tell you, you're like, man, that stinks. Because I felt the same way this week when I hit a nasty pothole. And I said, but taxes, God. (laughs) (laughs) My taxes, man. (laughs) Our taxes better our community, better our land. Your pools, your libraries, your park districts, 
your government, your law enforcement. Imagine your house catching on fire and God forbid it doesn't. And, and, and they pull up and your name is on the list. Oh, hasn't paid taxes. We can't use our tax water to put out this fire. It's, it's an obligation as a believer to be a good citizen. Pay your taxes. Matter of fact, pay your taxes. No shortcuts. No looking to get a deal. This is the idea that you are paying what you owe, your duty or your toll, as they would have had it back in first century times. Like you are paying what you owe because it batters our nation, our cities, our villages, our country in every way. And for those of us, for those of them who don't do right by taxes, according to Scripture, they also will have their punishment. Because the government and the governing authorities should be taking care of our money. But our job is to do what is right. Matter of fact, Jesus said this. Jesus said this in Mark 12, where, where Jesus is talking to the group. And, and you know what he says? Pay Caesar what is owed to Caesar. And pay God what is owed to God. And here's what we forget. If Caesar has this little amount of, of, of authority and position, God still has this amount of authority and position. And so what Jesus is saying is, you pay taxes upon what you owe. But at the end of the day, there is a sovereign God who rules and reigns over it all. And don't you worry about what Caesar owns, because guess what? God's owns Caesar. God's own everything. He owns our authority. He owns our government. And he owns the whole entire world. And so the exhortation here as a believer is to do right, is to be a good citizen, and what should cause an outrage for the believer if we bear the name of Jesus Christ as Christians and we do not govern to the rules and the laws of the land. What we do is we disobey God. When we don't submit, when we don't obey the law, the text says we disobey God. And I know that's hard. Believe me, I know it's hard to hear. Is this November when you go and you vote Friends, let me put a plug there that I think is wise. Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you know who you are voting for when you get to that booth. Make sure you've done all of your comparisons and all of your contrasting, all of your pros and your cons, and then you have the liberty to vote whoever the heck you want to vote for. But as a believer, we are called to obey the laws and the rules of the land. One, it pleases God. Two, when we don't, it's disobedient to the God who has appointed these men and women in positions. Four and a half years, I worked in municipal banking. The getting was good. I had one job. Keep the mayor happy, keep the village president happy. That's it. So I had to show up to these events. I had to go to all these late night socials where tickets, $1,000 to get in. And, and, and you know the the... the the scum that sometimes touched my hand with some of these faces that I knew. These, these positions that I like, man, your predecessor was awesome. You absolutely stink, right? But I couldn't say that. But I had a job to uphold. I had a business to run. But you know what? I left every time my conscience being clear. I'm not getting involved in schemes. I'm not getting involved in plans. Because I know at the end of the day, my ruler is not found in man, is not found in a party, is not found in a position. It's found in our Lord. And here's what that does. It ties in my allegiance to one person, to God. That our ultimate allegiance absolutely belongs to God. Again, Paul is writing this to, to Roman Christians who have been persecuted under their government. Oh, church, our ultimate allegiance is to God. If we hang our hat on anything or any person in this world, we absolutely get it wrong. We are going to be disappointed and empty every time we submit to those leaders, to those governing authorities who are in charge. Our submission is God. I love this. The state's power is limited. Our country power is limited, but our allegiance to country or government is never absolute. It's never going to work out. But our allegiance to God is absolutely full. It's comprehensive. It will work. What things belong to Caesar or what thing belongs to your village or what belongs to your land? Taxes, respect, and honor. But you know what, what belongs to God is you. 
your whole self, your heart, your mind, your soul, your life, your conscience, your existence, your everything belong to him. And so the only way to render the things that belong to God is to give God your whole life. And while we are just pilgrims passing through this, the Lord will be pleased with the work, dear brother, dear sister, that you do to honor him and obey what he has for us. So, Tay, what does this look like? Let me give you five points, and then I'm in my seat. Short five points. What, what does our relationship to governing authorities look like? To government, to people and parties maybe we don't like. What, what does it look like? Number one is that we submit to them. Again, not in blind submission or being laid down like a doormat or being steamrolled, but there is this sense of if God is sovereign over the entire world and universe and creation and salvation, then I better submit to those leaders he's established to be in charge. It's submit to them. Number two, number two is this, is you stand up for the right things. There will come a time, if not already, and I think that time is here and it is pressing where you have to stand up for the right things. There's just some things that will not work, should not work, can't work, and we have to stand up for the right things. And we do that with grace, and we do that with tact, and we do that with facts, and we do that with all of the truths, not just because we want to rebel. We do stand up for the right things. Number three is we seek unity despite differences. We seek unity despite differences. Our, our political conversations, the people we like, the people we, we vote for, we all are going to view, view different on that. We just all won't be the same. And our job as a believer is not to create silos and kick them down and run them over and get on our social media posts and say this and that. You know what our job is to do is to seek unity. It's to hopefully say, as a believer, this is where I agree, this is where I disagree. And so instead of bantering back on the chat, is you send them a message. Interesting thoughts, dot, dot, dot. Can we talk, weirdo? I mean, can we talk, brother or sister? <laughs> can we have a conversation to seek a fellowship, although we disagree? We seek unity despite tons and tons of differences. Number, number four, and this is just not the spiritual answer. But this is absolutely the godly answer, is that we pray for them. Is that we, we fall on our knees and we present Congress, let me see if I, the, the, uh, the legislative, the government, the executive, what's my other one? What's our four branches? Judicial, there it is. <laughs> that we submit all of them to a God who's established them because they are broken sinners and people. And our job is, Lord, would you help Mr. or Mrs.? Lord, maybe by wise counsel in one of their private rooms, maybe in their neighborhood or their, their tight circles, something is said or done to keep them on the right path. And Lord, dare we trust the Spirit to do the work? Dare we pray that the Holy Spirit would guide them and keep them? The answer is yes. Number five is that we hold fast that we hold fast to our hope in Christ. This is where I hang my hat. At the end of the day, it will not be because of no power, no might, no person, no party, no representative. You know what we hold on to? is Christ. 
because he promised that in this world we will have trouble, we will have trials, but those who believe in him, what he gives us is a home that looks nothing like this home. We're a home where there will be forever unity. We're a home where there will be forever worship. We're a home where we will absolutely sit at the rulers, at the king, at the Lord's feet, and we will be made new. Philippians 3, 20. I love this, and I am done because it's going to make me shout out this day. He says this, but our citizenship is not of this earth. Our citizenship is where? In heaven. And from heaven, from heaven, the text says, we look and we await, not from who we vote for, not for what we stand for, but from heaven as godly people, we await from heaven a Savior, the Lord Jesus. That's the name you won't see on the ballot, but that's the name who rules the earth. <laughs> that's the name who's better than the president. That's the name who's better than the emperor. That's the name who's better than the mayor or alderman. He says, but our citizenship is from heaven, and we wait from that heaven a Savior, the Lord Jesus. For we, we, for we will be transformed from our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. Guess what? Our rulers are all under his authority. And we submit and we follow him and wait until that day where he ushers us home to be with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the scriptures that teach every part of our lives. Like the word of God is effective. It's clear. And sometimes we have to wrestle through the hard things. And so, Lord, I simply pray for boldness and courage, for faith and strength to do all that you've commanded us to do. In the seasons, Lord, where yes, we want to raise our, our voice high and we want to have this fallen condition of rebellion against the men and women who are in position. But Lord, that doesn't please you. As the scripture says, actually, when we resist and disobey, we are disobeying you. But also, on the other hand, where the boldness and courage comes in, we will have to stand. We're going to have to look at some decisions being made and not agree with them and make life or family altering decisions because of that. And so, Lord, may it be in your own timing, not because of our anger or our angst or our rebellion. But we, we know it's from you. And then, Lord, let me practice what I preach. I pray right now for all our leaders who hold a position in this nation. I don't know where they are in faith. You do. I don't know where they are in thought or thinking or policies or procedures or bills or referendums. You do. And so, Lord, here we are as your believers, trusting you to do the work to bring about the change. In this broken, sin-saturated world, Lord, we believe you still are in charge. You still are in control. And so, Lord, whatever your will is, let it be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And then, Lord, I finally pray that we, the church, will be the light, just like we were this week with those law enforcement that they will walk into churches and be in community meetings and see pastors and Christians and leaders be in the light of what's needed to be done. And Lord, we look forward to that day where that Savior comes back and our real citizenship, our real passport will be stamped. Not as sojourners anymore, but permanent residents of heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor Tay said, we serve a sovereign God, and a sovereign God deserves worship. So if you would stand with me as we worship the Lord.
find ourselves again at a posture of looking to you. Thank you for the freedom of this land. Thank you for the comforts we have. Thank you for also the assignment you set us on as believers. Lord, may we be faithful to that. And there will be a day where we all will come together and shout and thank God for we made it over to worship our King Jesus and our Lord. Thank you for your people. Thank you for this worship. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for the word. And I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you give us two minutes? Have a seat for just a second. We promise to bring back to you on May 19th um, our, 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 our elder on ramp. Uh, about 36 days ago, we have Dave Erickson. I'm going to have him come up, uh, introduce himself, and told us a little bit about this. We have a system as we bring on a new elders part of our church. When we talk about government, in this case, not, of course, over the nations, but over our church, the job of our elders is to guard the doctrine, uh, to also make sure the culture of our church is healthy and thriving and growing, but then also to support our uh, our leaders and all that's going around here in our church. So uh, at this point, we were at this uh, juncture in the road where we needed to bring on another elder. Dave Erickson has been three to six months in kind of what we call the quiet phase where he was attending elders meeting. They were getting to know him. They were actually like, man, do we vote this guy off or do we keep him? And at that point, they felt after four and a half months like, hey, he's actually a good fit to his character, uh, to his walk with the Lord, to his marriage, and to be uh, an elder of our church. So today, what we need to do is affirm and vote that. And so, Dave, introduce yourself again. Tell us what value you bring to our elder team, and then we'll move on down with our affirmation. Yeah, sure. Oh, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Oh, there we go. Uh, my wife, Laura, uh, we've been married uh, coming up the end of this month on 19 years. And so we celebrate marriage and uh, have three kids. Um, our youngest is Mason, who's 11. Audrey's 13. And Jacob, raise your hand, 15. I am <laughs> um, a very, very blessed man um, having a wonderful family. And uh, so I've been attending Gospel Life Church uh, for about six years um, to see our family grow in steps of faith, serving and um, seeing our faith grow over the past six years has been a joy. Um, accepted Jesus as my Savior uh, when I was eight at VBS. So a plug for VBS next month. All right. Uh, go to That'll VBS. <laughs> um, and then it was around high school. It wasn't high school. I really uh, learned to appreciate um, having a personal relationship with Jesus. And uh, my love for appreciation for Jesus has um, increased since then. So um, excited to serve in this role. My spiritual gifts are include discernment, faith, um, encouragement. So my natural gifts include business acumen, problem solving, critical thinking, and really feel called to serve in this way at this time and um, grateful for the opportunity. So thank you for allowing me to serve. Love the church, uh, love Jesus, love my family, and looking forward Amen. to serving on this uh, for the church. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And Dave, I know if you've gone through those meetings, you've sat through, been examined, you examined us as a team as well, or our elder board as a team, uh, rather to make sure they are also the things of God. And so for you to desire that office is the right thing. And so uh, Dave and I personally have been in small group for at least three three years now. Uh, and so I know this man personally, and he's, he's a man of God. But uh, again, I can only advise you do the voting. Uh, and so Dave, I appreciate your heart uh, to love the Lord, uh, to follow after him. And uh, I believe you make our team absolutely better by fulfilling this, this, this role. So God bless you and your family. And so church, here's what we do now. Uh, in a moment, I'll actually raise your right hand. We will then affirm uh, this decision to move Dave as a elder. What you have had in the last 30 to 60 days, uh, you had a moment to come to our elder board, to our pastors, with any um, uh, 
grievances or anything you need clarity on. Uh, I believe those have all been handled at the moment. And so this decision uh, is now clear to continue to move forward. And so by the elevation of your right hand, uh, those of you affirmed to vote to have a new elder in the sense of Dave Erickson to join our board, you can raise your right hand. You can disdain if you do not care to uh, to vote as, as well. So next then, thank you so much. Next we'll you. bring you the on-ramp of what it clearly looks like and then we would then install him at a later day. I don't know what it was over at the other service. Hopefully they didn't take tomatoes and things like that and boo you off. Because you're here. All right, so we'll then bring you back clear steps of what an installation looked like if that is our next thing moving forward. So Dave, we appreciate you. Church, we appreciate you. I appreciate you keeping us honest, keeping us uh, as as a church who really want to do the things of God. And thank you for this extra time here. So let's pray and then we will exit to enjoy this beautiful, yes. beautiful day. Lord, thank you for your church. Thank you, though, although we are far from perfect, you give us leaders to lean into the hard things, to grow us, to challenge us, and to make sure we are doing the things of Christ. And so, Lord, with our entire elder board, if you give them the vision, the insight, the truth, the moments to have the hard conversations to make us right as a church. Bless Dave and his next steps to this leadership position. I pray, God, that it is absolutely fulfilling. I pray that it is right. I pray that uh, that, that room continues to honor every thought and decision and is grounded in Jesus Christ. And thank you for our church. May we say yes to the things of God. May, we, may you stretch us in ways we never thought this next season. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Family, I love you guys, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it because I'm sticking around. And uh, so enjoy your afternoon. May God bless you and keep you. See you next week. Love you. You too, man.